Hi, my name is Steve Joseph, and I'm the author of this release book, Cranky Superpowers, Life Lessons Learned from the Common Crankosaurus Chronicles. Now, I talk about a lot of different things about crankiness and stories about how and why we get cranky and how we find our cranky superpowers. One of the chapters I like to talk about today is one of my favorite chapters, Crankosaurus Menopause, because it's how we get along with each other and how we could better get along with each other. So I always wondered, or I always hear, that you know people aren't getting married anymore these days and didn't even know why until just recently I went to a wedding and uh, it was a very nice couple uh, Seymour and Zelda, and and I heard a wedding bells. So I, I, I haven't heard wedding bells like this before. So the minister he asked Seymour first. Seymour, do you take your bride Zelda for better or for worse? Seymour said, Yeah, sure. No, 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 no. Said the minister. You have to pick a pick one or the other. You can't get both, better or worse. Seymour thought for a second and said, you know, when I picked Zelda, I knew I wasn't picking a, a beauty queen, so I'll go with worse. How much worse could it get? Oh, I hear it gets a lot worse. Oh, well, you know, I don't want to put pressure on her. She's, you know, she gets very nervous. I'll go with worse. Okay. Zelda. Do you take this man, Seymour, for better or for worse? And Zelda thought for a second, you know, when I picked Seymour, I knew I was picking from the bottom of the barrel. And when you pick from the bottom of the barrel, you only hope to get go up. So I'll go with better. Who's looking, who's talking about bottom of the barrel? I'm gonna change my answer. I want better, I'm picking better. Zelda was going, I don't know if I could do better. I, I, I get very nervous. I, I get, I'm getting a panic attack, panic attack. You know, minister, he always would sing to me, don't go changing to try to please me. I never want you to work so hard. I love you just the way you are. Bull crap. Uh, minister. Could, could, could we do something? Can, can we both be better or worse? Is there something we could do? Could we just be, say the same? Nobody says the same. You, you, you either get better or worse. And I can't do both. If you want better or worse, you need lawyers. Well, what do these lawyers do? Well, you have to negotiate. What is considered better? What is considered worse? Let's say you, Seymour, become worse with, uh, or better. Or see, uh, Zelda thinks you got worse, or vice versa. This all has to be negotiated. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, we can't afford that. Uh, Zelda, I think, will we'll go with worse. Well, worse. And, and see more. Uh, I, I, I feel sick already. Let's go with sickness and not, not the health. Okay, sickness it is. And they lived happily ever after, I can tell you that. It's very, very nice. So I learned from this in my relationship, we get to be 5% insane, 20% crazy, and 75% normal. We're required 75% normal. And you may think this is insane, but it's counterintuitive. If I told you that you're allowed 0% crazy when you do become crazy and everybody does become crazy you can't say that you're you're crazy you have to say i'm not crazy you're the one who's really crazy and that makes me crazy who likes to be told they're crazy by a crazy person then i think you have become insane and we've become this one big crazy insane family and fighting back and forth by giving us permission to be crazy we appreciate it a little bit more and we end up getting using up one to two percent crazy a year. With zero percent crazy, you end up more like fifty or sixty percent. So, by using this formula, we end up to be effectively cranky and kind of laugh at it all the time, and getting to appreciate each other way, way more than if we weren't allowed to be crazy. The zero is not good. So. Thank you. Just wanted to share that with you. Take care.
Welcome to Uncut with Lucia. I'm Lucia Matuonto, and we are back at the RV Book Fair 2023. Please join me in welcoming my co-host for this event, Marco Matuonto. Marco is a renewable energy expert, the head of production at the Relatable Voice magazine, and an enthusiast of travel and, of course, photography. So welcome, Marco. Thank you, Lucia. I'm very, very happy and thrilled to be here. It's my debut today to the RV Book Fair. Mm -hmm. And we are excited today to introduce you to three authors who will share their exciting experiences in travel's uh, tales. First, we have Pat Beckley, the author of seven captivating books, including 70 years worth of travel, snippets from a colorful and interesting life. Hi, Pat. Welcome. Hi, Marco. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here and to be on this side of the microphone for once, because <laughs> usually I'm Lucia's co-host. So thank you very much for this invitation. You're welcome, Pat. And next we have Jeremiah Gilbert, an award-winning photographer and travel writer. His extensive travels have taken him to over a hundred countries across six continents. His latest work, All to Plan C, A Return to Travel, is available now. So Jeremiah, welcome to the RV Book Fair. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate being here. It's our pleasure, Jeremiah. Thank you. And, and then we have uh, Douglas Weissman. Douglas is an author and travel writer who has explored diverse corners of the world. Welcome, Douglas. We're glad you. you're here. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I didn't even let you finish your sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. This is what we need. <laughs> yes. So first, we would like to learn how it all started. So, Pat... You've been my co-host at the RV Book Fair for two consecutive years. And I can say that I know a lot about you, but I would <laughs> you could share a little bit about yourself with our other guests. Okay, well, um, I started my writing career just over two years ago during COVID. Uh, like everyone else, I was alone, fed up, spent three weeks lying on the sofa watching rubbish on Netflix and eating too much chocolate, <laughs> drinking too much red wine. And I thought, Pat, this is ridiculous. Just get a group, do something. Why don't you write a book? So I just got paper and in two weeks, I'd written my first book, a historical novel. Um, and then I got carried away because I think you'll all agree once you start writing, it's like a drug. You can't stop. You know, you've got to you've got all this. I often joke that someone's taken off the top of my head and 70 years worth of words have just come flying out because I didn't publish my first book until just before my 70th birthday. Um, so that started me. And then I got carried away and wrote more and more and um, wrote my memoirs and touched on my travels in there. And then. Last year, I was in the middle of writing another book and I was watching at the same time as writing, as you do, being multitasking authors. I was watching a YouTube um, with a very attractive young Italian travel writer, a man. And I was quite mesmerized. He was young enough to be my son, but very attractive. And I was busy watching him. And then I suddenly thought, actually, I could write a travel memoir. I've done heaps of really interesting travel. So I just I just started writing and produced my my little travel memoir from that so and then went back to my ordinary bread and butter writing thank That's you that. and, and, yes okay go ahead please no no I was just going to say stop me if I talk too much mm -hmm. because you know how excited I get and passionate and carried away thank you Pat uh, I know that you've been writing a lot seven books and almost eight books in only two years and it, this is fascinating thank you and Douglas I was listening actually to your captivating story on my catch the story podcast and I discovered oh. that you are a storyteller so could you <laughs> tell us more about that that's quite interesting yeah uh, I think storyteller is the best way to describe me because I have eight books published and a ninth book coming out early next year. But I also have won awards for screenplays and won award for travel essays. So 
it for me the story is all about making connection yeah. in whatever it may be but and that story is is really about however it comes across so it could be in a novel it could be in an essay it could be in a, a screenplay or it could be standing in front of people sharing a lecture or over a podcast and that's why i think storyteller is more apt than just novelist or a travel writer but traveling seems to be the thing that gave me a better understanding mm-hmm. of how storytelling connects people yeah. and and then kind of pushed me forward from there yeah. it's very cool yeah really i agree with you storytelling connects people and it's so good it's so good to listen to good stories or even bad stories sometimes it's fun <laughs> <laughs> to listen. it's true it's true i love i love so I love a good story naturally, but sometimes a bad story is absolutely equally as compelling. Uh, sometimes it's because then I know what a good story actually is. And sometimes it's fun just to kind of spin off of what a bad story starts with yeah. and then maybe make it a better story in my head or just kind of tickle it a little. It's it's fun. <laughs> yes. And Jeremiah, please introduce yourself and give our viewers some insights into your background please yeah my background is rather eclectic um, my day job is a math professor at a college um, my first four books were poetry um, then but during that time around 2005 uh, is when i started traveling i had been doing photography since high school um, And then when I started traveling, uh, basically, I had gotten a full-time teaching gig. So (laughs) I could actually take summers off and, you know, just fell in love with the travel and it gave me a focus for my photography. So I sort of, you know, I created a website, wrote about my travels, added links to photos. And that sort of was how I started tying in the writing with the photography. Uh, However, it wasn't till 2020. So it's similar, you know, pandemic, we're all stopped. We can't travel. And so I thought, well, now it's been about 15 years of travel. I probably have a few good tales to tell. So I just sat down and started writing out some ideas, you know, how my wife and I met on a trip I wasn't supposed to be on, you know, how I spent my 40th birthday in Paris with no ID or money because I was pickpocketed on the metro, things like that. Uh, And so that's how the first travel book came about. And so I thought, okay, I quite enjoy this. And then, you know, 2021 came and still wasn't quite ready to start traveling again. Mm. So then I thought, well, you know, I had actually written quite a bit for my old website. So let me take some of that. And that became my second book. And then, you know, finally, I decided to wait till 2022 to start traveling again and testing the waters and seeing what was happening. And I thought, well, that could be an interesting book. You know, my first two were about past travels. This would be current. Um, and I just happened, I, my first two books did not include my photography. And I just happened to check with my publisher and I said, could you include photos with a book? And they said, yeah. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that changes things. Uh, so the current book, The Onda Plan C, is my first to include my photography as long as, as well as the writing. And so I really enjoyed doing that. It was a bit more of a challenge, you know, editing photos and editing text, Uh, but I quite enjoyed it. So I I think I'm going to do that format from now on. So the pandemic brought you some good ideas. Yes, definitely. And um, we all here have something in common. We love traveling and writing. So let's kick off this discussion by learning how you all ventured into this field. Marco, can you ask first? Sure, of course. Yeah, well, actually, Pat told us already what inspired or I mean, this uh, uh, handsome guy from Italy, which I can understand. (laughs) We Italians are very handsome, so (laughs) (laughs) difficult to resist. But uh, what was the experience of writing about that? So what was the experience? It was the way you thought after you started doing that. How did you, I mean, I'm sure you enjoyed, but what were the key feelings? Um, you are talking to me, Marco. Yes? Yeah, I'm asking you, Pat, yeah. 
Yes. Sorry, I was just so excited thinking about the young Italian man. Oh, yeah, yeah, you and Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I had always, as a little girl, been desperate to travel, but I came from a, a poor family. There was, we didn't even have family holidays or a car or anything, so it was never an option. And I lived in, in England in a tiny little rural village, but I was a great reader. So I read everything I could get my hands on about the world. And then mum and dad bought a Reader's Digest Atlas. And I'm still excited, 60 odd years on, 70 years on. Um, it was a big blue shiny book and we were only allowed to touch it if we washed our hands first. I mean, it sounds archaic now, doesn't it? When kids, even tiny kids just flick on a screen, but to me, it was the most exciting thing in the world to wash my hands and then be allowed to open this big book and see all the maps of the world and read little bits about each country. And I guess I just got very, very enthused. Um, I didn't actually get to go anywhere abroad until my, I was 15 and I went on a school trip to U Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And that just made it kind of, that was it. The floodgates were opened. And over the years, I just did a bit of traveling as time and money and circumstances allowed. But it's a passion. I mean, a, an absolute passion of mine. Um, and I've lived abroad. And obviously, I now live in New Zealand. So I've emigrated from England to New Zealand. So, yeah, I could wax lyrical for hours. But you need I need to let these other lovely gentlemen have their say <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Sure. And Douglas, um, what drove you to write about travel? Was it your experiences and love for exploring different countries or was there more to it? Well, first, I want to say that I could listen to Pat talk about her experience forever. Uh, oh, <laughs> so I was, yeah, I was totally involved. I was ready for you to just keep going. But <laughs> second, the, I, I fell into travel writing and I both love and hate that I say that because it's kind of a dream job, right? Everybody who loves to travel always thinks, oh, I would love to travel and write about it and that would be my job. And how do I do it? And I have no advice for people because I answered a Craigslist ad in 2013 and that is how I got to become a travel writer. <laughs> but uh, it was, I always loved telling stories, right? Douglas Weissman, the storyteller is how I put myself. But it was the fact that I had lived abroad in Italy, actually, for a year in 2006 to 2007. I then graduated from university and it was that was in 2009, kind of peak Great Recession. Mm -hmm. And there was no job waiting for me. So I had saved up some money and thought, OK, I'm just going to do a year around the world. And then I came back to the States, did not get into graduate school as kind of that waiting game of what am I actually going to do with my grown up life? So I decided to go to South America for a little while, and then I did get into graduate school. So I went there and found this ad where I learned to write or learned to write better, I'll say. I learned to write better, found this ad, responded to it with information for, basically from blog posts that I used that was really only to update my family and friends when I was traveling. So it wasn't supposed to be anything that I could monetize, but then I cleaned them up, sent it in as a writing sample, and they hired me freelance for the time being. And I was able to make that my career. And then from that, also gain inspiration for writing novels and things on the side. So I was in a, a very happy place. Yeah. Nice. Wow. That was amazing that you were in another, living in another country and started studying there and also writing there. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah I, I've, I kept notes, I kept emails, I kept blog posts when I was in Italy. And then, of course, being in Europe, when you're in your early 20s as an American, you try to hit as many countries as possible. Uh, and then it just, well, yeah, once you travel, it is so hard to stop. And I traveled when I was, I traveled around the United States when I was a kid with my family, but it just didn't have that same feeling of going somewhere that felt completely different and kind of taking that adventurous spirit and that feeling of exploration and again, that feeling of connection, because you're talking to people that have no, that maybe there's a language barrier or the culture is so different because I come from Los Angeles and now I'm in a small town in Thailand. And what, you know, what, what are we talking about? How are we communicating? Why am I even there? And so all these things, and that, that question comes up a lot when I travel and I go to all these small places. Why are, why are you here? <laughs> uh, there's always a reason. And sometimes even finding the answer to that question can be a reason in itself. 
Thank you. Marco, is it? Yeah, no, since uh, yeah, um, we were talking about adventures, I, I want to ask uh, Jeremiah, when, when you travel, of course, uh, planning hotels and transportation, that, that's important, but uh, you leave an element of surprise or you are uh, you research uh, in details of where you go in, in your trip. I, I try to do both. Uh, I try to do some preliminary research. Uh, I mean, my, my general rule of thumb is, have I been before? No. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you know, I like to get you know some background information, do a little research, have a loose plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, you know, be open for you know, like for instance, you know, all the travels I did for the latest book, I had a couple extra days in there because I just wasn't sure. Yep. Uh, in general, I like to do that because you know you start talking with locals or other people who you know are also traveling, and then they start saying, "Oh, did you go here? Oh, did you try that?" And you think, okay, you know, let me adjust. So to me, you know, I like to find both, you know, balance, you know, and also sometimes, I mean, I remember years ago, I was on a trip, we were, I was in the Caucasus, um, mm -hmm. Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and, you know, I had a travel book with me, and it was the most up to date, and I swear every restaurant or location I tried was either closed, you know, or the hours were no longer accurate. Uh, so, you know, in a case like that, is, you know, I like to have the background, but also just wing it. And yeah. just, you know, there's times where, you know, some of the best experiences have come from that. And so I just think, you know, it's, it's good to be open. You know, yeah. I have some friends, they just buy a one-way ticket and go, and that's great for them. But, you know, I like to have a little more background and a little more planning, uh, at least to get the first hotel booked, you know. Yes. Uh, but I think, you know, it's also very important to have that just, like you so. know openness and just you know because so, sometimes i've found about locations that i was just a few miles from that i didn't know about and it's like oh man you know okay if i ever go back you know i'm heading there uh, so like i said now i try to factor in a little extra time yes. uh, and also yeah I'll, I'll be in new zealand in december so i'll, I'll wave <laughs> when i arrive hi i'm here <laughs> nice pat is in new, so new yeah. zealand in the future, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's tomorrow for, for you guys. Where right, I right, yes. <laughs> How does tomorrow look, by the way? Actually, not bad. It's, it's a bit grey out there, but the sun will come out later, so all good. <laughs> we won't talk about the state of the world tomorrow. No. That's not <laughs> and Pat, for you, uh, as you commented, uh, you started work uh, writing two years ago, and you are I say that Pat Pat is impossible because she keeps writing and she's now uh, publishing her eighth book. And so could you share uh, a little bit about this book 70 years worth of travel? It means that you've been traveling since you were born. <laughs> I know somebody, a, a very critical Dutch friend, and and I, I don't know. I forgive me if any of you are Dutch, but she's very direct. She speaks exactly as she thinks, regardless of whether it's going to offend anybody. Which I understand. She tells me is a natural, a national trait. Anyway, she saw the cover of my book, which has got a photograph of me on it. I don't know if you can, you probably can't see photograph of me. Um, in my thirties when I first went to Fiji, and um, or when I lived in Fiji, and. She looked at the book and she said, that's a ridiculous title. She said, you she said, you haven't traveled for 70 years. I said, well, no, but it kind of implies that, you know, I'm old and I've been traveling a long time. And she just didn't get it really. But most people, most people do understand. Yeah, basically, I've started with talking about how, as I said before, I was enthused by all the stuff I read and things like that. So kind of it has been nearly well, now it has been longer than 70 years. Um and now I've forgotten what the exact question was you asked me. Sorry. <laughs> a bit about your book. Oh, about my book. Yeah. So basically it is just snippets. As the subtitle says, snippets of a colourful and interesting life. When I first thought of that, I thought, oh, that sounds awfully like boasting, saying, oh, I've had a colourful and interesting life. But it kind of sums it up because they are just literally little snippets of my travels, but quite a lot of little amusing things and... Um, uh, and and yeah, just just because for me, travel is all about the people I meet. Really, that that for me is what my travel is. I don't go to lie on something. I mean, I do lie on exotic beaches and sit around reading 
books. But basically, I just love to get out there, meet the people. And so consequently, I've got friends all over the world who are people I've just touched, touched lives with briefly during my travels. Enough. I love it. Can I just say, I just want to say two things to my fellow guests. Douglas, you have my dream job. I'm so (laughs) envious that you actually get paid to write about travel. That's wonderful. And Jeremiah, I think it's lovely that you now put photos in your books because when I was doing mine, I thought, oh, how sad that I can't put lots of photos in because I think a lot of people don't have the imagination that we do. You know, we can read pages and, and picture it in our heads, but a lot of people need those those physical um, things, mm. don't they? So, yeah, I was just fascinated by both of you. Thank you. Totally agree. Yes. And also, with I love when you said that it's so nice when you meet with people during the trips. Marco can say that I keep meeting with so many people when we are traveling and it's kind of I keep contact with them and Marco sometimes asks me who is this person I said oh, I'm married in oh, that okay. restaurant in this place said, wow she oh. talks to anybody so <laughs> and, and I'm quite the opposite more reserved so <laughs> I talk to <laughs> so Douglas, your latest book, uh, Life Between the Seconds, and that is not about travel, as you said. Uh, it, it weaves between past and present. Can you tell us a little bit about it uh, and uh, give us a, a little glimpse? Yeah, absolutely. So it was inspired by travel and that idea that I met some Madres de la Plata de Mayo when I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And for those who don't know, that it started by women who lost children or family members, fathers, brothers, uncles, etc., during the dirty war in Argentina, and they disappeared. And so these women started marching around the presidential plaza, carrying photos or signs, just completely silent, but kind of demanding to be heard at the same time. And they were still doing it. This was in 2011. And as far as I know, it's still going on today, even though many of the mothers are no longer uh, you know, passed on uh, because of their age, but it's been passed on to other family members who still do it for all those who have no information on where their family members were taken or what happened to them. Some children were given away. Some of uh, many, many members of the family were were killed. But I, I saw this, I talked with them. I was so moved by it that I felt like I, I just have to, there's a story there that I want to share with those who don't know it. And I didn't feel like I could just put that into the story in contemporary times without giving that emotional presence to the past and kind of that respect to the past. And then when I was in in that same trip, I was in Mexico City and I went to Frida Kahlo's house, which is now a museum. And she had two clocks in her kitchen. One was stopped on the time of her and Diego Rivera's divorce. And another one right next to it was stopped on the time of their remarriage. And I thought that was such an interesting concept to stop clocks to kind of keep a memory. And that created my contemporary character, Peter, who stops clocks whenever he wants to keep a memory. And so I thought that their friendship, him being present and moving forward and her kind of having to be pulled into the present as opposed to the past was really where the where the core of the story was. So it's both of them trying to run away from their past, but being dragged into the future together. It's interesting. And not for Jeremiah. So I remember interviewing you during the pandemic when mm-hmm. travel was just a dream. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. And we were just trying to imagine how we were going to be able to travel again. Now, I've been seeing on Instagram that you've been all over the place. I think you were in Iceland, if I'm Mm -hmm. not wrong, Greenland. So now uh, you are back on the road and have published on to Plan C, A Return to Travel. So can you tell us a little bit more about this book? Yeah, so as I said, the the thinking was, you know, my first two travel books were all past travels. Uh, so I thought wouldn't it be interesting to, you know, okay, I'm returning. We all had to pause. Uh, different experience, 
uh, because you know, the others were based on journals and notes and things and you know, written sometimes years later versus this time it was like, okay, I'm actually like taking notes on my phone you know, <laughs> or I'm writing things at night. Uh, so it's a little different in that regard. Uh, and I just wanted to share the experience, both in terms of, you know, what's changed, uh, what stayed the same, you know, so my, my first trip back, so it was what, May of 2022 was Fiji. Mm -hmm. And that was because a Fiji New Zealand trip was the first that had been canceled in 2020. So I thought, okay, it seemed like a good return. Uh, and that was one of those that, you know, every month it seemed the different there was different requirements and they kept changing in terms of testing and things like that. So it was like, it was, so I was sort of like keeping track of headlines, you know, and then when I got there, it had that added element. I was, I was talking with, you know, local guides and taxi drivers and such, you know, what's it been like? How did you survive these years without tourists? Uh, so I wanted to include that element. Uh, however, I didn't include it in the photography. In the photography, I wanted it to just be, these are the sites, this is why you come. Uh, I wanted to keep that distinction so you don't see mass, you don't see piles of luggage, things like that. Um, though I will say the original intent was to be the, the first full year back. So Fiji was May of 22, and then I did Turkey in April of this year. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I discovered I could include the photography, I thought that would make too long of a book. So I ended with just 2022. So just what I did in 2022. Uh, but it happened that I was granted a sabbatical uh, in this past spring. So because of that, we did Ecuador and then Turkey. And then, yeah, this summer we did Iceland, Greenland, uh, Faroe Islands, which is where I want to move now. I just absolutely fell in love with that landscape. Uh, so I don't know where the those newest travels will go. Um, you know, as you see, I'm going through the photos and posting them on my website and I'm online. Don't know where they're going to, any of the writing's going to fit. I said, yeah, I have Australia, New Zealand planned for December and January. Uh, going to do, uh, going to go up West Africa next summer. Um, but yeah, we'll see. For me, it's like the, you know, I enjoy the photography first and foremost. I'm still taking my notes. I still have my journals and we'll see. I'm, I'm currently working on three different book ideas. So yeah, I'm not sure which one's going to come next. Sounds like a good plan to be traveling, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but yeah, so happy to be back traveling. I mean, that, that to me is the top priority. If I get good photos or good stories, that's wonderful. But you know, the top priority is just to travel. Yeah, and I remember we were in Morocco when the pandemic hit, and it was we were so like. Do you remember, Marco? We tried to buy a mask, but yeah. the, we no, found no. only one mask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to choose which one of us were going to wear the mask. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I said we are not going to do, to travel anymore I was so like scared but thank goodness now things are getting normal and I have a common question for all of you um first you pet out of okay. out of curiosity when you travel do you prefer to travel light or bring along everything but the kitchen sink okay like in, an <laughs> in an ideal world I would like to say that I travel light in truth and all honesty I don't because in my head I think oh supposing this happens supposing that happens uh, I don't want to wear that twice uh -uh. um for many 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 years until probably 10 years ago I used to always pack a cocktail dress and high-heeled shoes in case I got invited to dinner on a yacht that never happened in all my years of travel so now at least I don't have to take those in my case so that's good but no I'm afraid I travel far too heavy. I get to my destinations and I always go to many, many places and I regret every second that I'm dragging that damn heavy case. And I think Pat just learned to travel light, but I don't. 
I understand you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, women are like this. Uh, sometimes we don't feel like wearing bad clothes that day. So we need more clothes. We need more options. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, wear some 10% of what she brings. <laughs> That's <laughs> proven. Well, the, th the thing is, Marco, and I really don't want to start a domestic argument here, no. but this <laughs> means it's very easy for you men to just wear a T-shirt and true. shorts. Whereas we have to have this top and that matches and they, these shoes have to match and this bag. And it's ridiculous. And I'm the first person to admit it's ridiculous. But I've reached the age of 72 and I haven't managed to change. So I don't really think I ever will now. Yes. I understand you, Pat. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it's, it's not a gender thing either. I, I always pack too much, but it's not necessarily clothes. It's everything else. Yeah. Like when I first went backpacking, I brought a DVD case. Like, oh, I, I have my computer. I mean, this is early 2000s. So it was like, I have my computer because I need it for X, Y, Z. So I'll just bring these in case I'm bored and stuck in a train station somewhere or on a really. So I did it and it was a pain and it was so heavy, but I did it. And it kind of taught me as long as you can fit it all in one bag, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. yeah. But even if you travel without family and of course, cats, <laughs> uh it's you know now now that yeah that was i was in my early 20s so traveling without anything it was fine and i still overpacked and now i have a four-year-old who want who goes everywhere and my wife so now my bag is full of kind of overflow oh can't fit this in in the little <laughs> one's bag so we're gonna find a place for in my bag oh can't fit the hair care stuff in in my wife's bag so now it's gonna go into mine and again, as long as it fits into one bag, we figure it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I use yeah. 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 So I have a similar. I, I actually try to pack pretty light, but if I have any space in my bag, my wife takes it. So, because <laughs> yeah, my, my I mean, even the, our upcoming trip, she's already planning out which outfit should go with which location. You know, again, doesn't want to be seen. I've already been photographed in that outfit. You know, versus you know, I don't want to be photographed so <laughs> i can be wearing the same shirt you know it doesn't matter to me um I, you know i try to do the same thing with my photography i just i usually travel with one camera and two mm -hmm. lenses because uh, to me it adds part of the challenge you know what can i do with this equipment and also just yeah as, as time goes on the heavy the heavy camera bag is just too much you know i've, I've developed some arthritis in the shoulder so it's not as not as pleasant, so I, I do try to travel light in that regard. You know, but it also depends. I mean, sometimes you know, we've done some trips where it's going to be hot and cold over the few months we're traveling. That's different. Uh, you know, versus you know, the upcoming trip should be pretty similar in temperature, so it makes it a little easier. Um, but no, like I said, I I have learned any any space I free up, my wife takes. So. You know, again, like you say, as long as it fits in a bag, it's we'll make it work. You know, that hot and cold differential, though, that is a killer. Oh, that is I, terrible. It's ter I went from uh, Thailand to India, and it, it was fine. It was fine, but then I went up into Kashmir in February, mm. and mm. I didn't have any winter clothes. Yeah. And so I'm in the Himalayas in February, wearing three pairs of pants and four right. shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and a sweater and as many socks as I could fit on my feet because it yeah. was all I could do to not freeze. Exactly. Fire. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, worth it, but still. Oh, no, no. Hard. Yeah, I've been there too. I, my, my first winter in London, I mean, I'm, I'm a native Southern Californian. Yeah. And I just realized that I own nothing that's warm enough. And so the same thing, I'm wearing double, triple everything. Uh, my mother-in-law is in London, so I actually left a jacket with her. Okay, if I'm ever back here in the winter, that's my jacket because nothing I, I have in Southern California is warm enough. It's just, it's crazy. And actually, uh, I have an extra question for you. Uh, now it's for all of you, okay? So let's start with Marco. Um, what was the place or the country you visited that you liked the most? Maybe I enjoy Thailand very much. I mean, we, we spent there only a week and uh, it should have been more, but it was really very interesting and very different and people very nice. So it's, it's something that we need to do again. And uh, and we took a very nice pictures. So it was, and the food was fantastic. So, Which yeah. Is... Pat? 
Oh, that's a really hard one. Um, Fiji is obviously in my heart because I lived there for, for a while and I and I have very close people there. Um, Venice, I adore, but only out of season. I never yeah. would go in season. Um, Egypt, I loved Egypt. Morocco, I love most places. So I'm not the best person to answer that question. Douglas? I, I similarly am a terrible person to ask because I find joy in, I would say, 99% of the places that I've gone. My So the way I kind of rate things is really just the places that surprised me the most. And that's kind of how I find them to be popular in my own mind, because then when somebody says, oh, what should I do here? It's like, oh, well, that's going to pop up first. Uh, so I would say Cambodia would be top of my list because it surprised me. I had no expectations and it surpassed everything I ever thought I could do there. Uh, so Cambodia and probably um, Slovenia, those are the two that surprised me the most in the best of ways. Nice. It's Slovenia. I've never heard anything about this counter. I, I need to check it online. It's gorgeous. It's You'd love it. And Jeremiah? Well, I'd say in general, um, Central America and Southeast Asia have been some of my favorite locations. Uh, totally agree with Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, was particularly taken with Vietnam. Uh, particularly central Vietnam. I would love to get back to Hoi An and Hue someday. Uh, just f found it an incredible, incredibly beautiful country and very friendly. But again, that's all Southeast Asia. Um, also had a, uh, two wonderful trips in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Um, so in general, I really like Central America, but those trips were particularly enjoyable. Uh, I, my wife jokingly described uh, El Salvador as the Canadians of Central America. <laughs> they were so friendly and so nice. Uh, really enjoyed that trip. Nice. And for me, um, I go with Thailand. Thailand. I love Thailand. Food, massage, beaches, <laughs> everything that I dream about. <laughs> <laughs> also I went um I have to tell you that I love Italy every time I go to Italy and I visit a different city I really love Italy there is another country that I really loved but ah, Bali Indonesia mm -hmm. just because people are adorable they are so nice they make you feel so important and of, of course the landscape so but it's difficult to choose the one we like the most. To finish this panel, I would like to know, Marco, you want to ask first because I don't no. stop talking. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would like, uh, maybe we we'll start with Pat. What is uh, the next for you, Pat, at the moment? What, what is the uh, project you're working on? Oh, well, writing-wise, I'm actually writing um, another historical fiction novel, but this time it's based... I, I, the first two I wrote were completely fictional. I just made them up. Um, and then I realized that I loved doing research. Absolutely loved it, which is crazy because I hated it at school. But mm -hmm. I think with the internet now, it's so easy. You know, you just click a few buttons and you get all these answers. Um, so I thought, why don't I write his, more historical fiction, but based on my own ancestors, who were just very mm -hmm. ordinary people, um, but uh, quite poor people, but they all lived in London, they lived through the two world wars and all the, you know, everything. So I started writing and got absolutely fascinated, kept going down rabbit holes and coming up with all these new things. Um, and so I did, I've already published two of those and I'm just working on the third one, which is actually based on my own parents' lives. Um, and I think it's great that we all keep notes and journals because my mum did. Um, I mean, she, she was just a very ordinary person whose life was kind of squashed by circumstances, but she as a child had always wanted to travel and write and be an artist and all that stuff. And so she kept lots and lots of not journals, but little notes. And when I cleared out their house after they died, I found all this stuff, shoved it in a box. And now 10 years later, I'm writing their life story, but in a fictional way. And so I ferreted out all these all this stuff. And I found the most incredible things like tiny, tiny little three inch red leather diaries from 1944 when she was in the war working on search like sites and so all of that kind of stuff and and her feelings about things and the only reason I'm mentioning that is because 
it goes with us keeping notes ourselves and writing about them later because I know that she will be thrilled that I'm putting some of her stuff into a book. Yeah. Um, and so that's that. And person, personally, I'm just writing more and more and more and more. And Lucia asked me for an article for her magazine. So I just <laughs> whack one off, tell a story, do some talks. I'm going down to the South Island next month to do three lots of um, talks. And I just... It's opened up a whole new world for me because my husband of 27 years abandoned me five years ago, just before COVID. And so I could have gone into a complete decline, you know, at the age of 67 to lose everything you've worked for and all that stuff in your future. Um, and my only child was living on the other side of the world at the time. Um, writing has saved my sanity completely. So having got that grasp on my sanity, I'm absolutely not going to let it go. So yeah. anytime anyone suggests I write about something, woo, just get on with it. <laughs> but as far as travel goes, obviously New Zealand is a wonderful country to live in because the travel here, as you know, um, Jeremiah is superb. I mean, if for a tiny country, it's got everything you could possibly want in it. Um, so I will do quite a lot of that and then next year I've got a big trip planned going to the States because a few years ago I wrote a I co-authored a book called The Warrior Women Project um, with 21 or 20 American ladies who were all immigrant immigrants mm -hmm. most of them were from Africa um, and they were writing about women's experience as, as immigrants and so I was asked if I would write um as well uh i'm old enough to be their mother they actually all call me the queen mother and obviously i'm white um so my immigration experience is quite different but i have lived several times abroad so i'm going over to the states to finally meet them all in person because we've never met we did it all on zoom we wrote the whole book on zoom um you know we've had we have all our weekly chats on zoom so that will be exciting and while i'm there i'll see a few places that i've that I really want to see. And hopefully I will get Lucia to come to New York and I can meet her in New York. This is on my wish list as well. So yeah, lots of plans. And I, I think the secret is never to give up. No. My daughter gave me the best compliment ever the other day. I was telling Lucia yesterday, I'm so excited. She's my only child. I was 43 when I had her. So I was a very old mother, but we are close. And she was on the phone the other day and asked me what I was doing. She always wants to make sure I'm okay. And, you know, in her head, I'm this ancient old lady that needs to be checked up on every day in case I've killed over. Um, so I was just telling her, oh, I'm doing this. I'm going here and I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And she said, mum, you are uncontrollable. And <laughs> I just was so happy because I've spent the majority of my life being controlled by, by men. And now I'm apparently uncontrollable, which is glorious at my age so yeah um lots of lots of exciting lots of things yeah. lots of plans lots of <laughs> it's funny because lucia tells the same to her mother that she is uncontrollable yeah. <laughs> my mom <is>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you pat so many projects it's wonderful and douglas what's on the horizon for your future adventures besides sending more stories to catch the story uh i'll gladly send more stories to catch the story i actually feel like now after listening to pat i don't have enough uh, <laughs> the next year uh, so i'll have to come up with more projects but uh my my next book is going to be released uh early next year the official publication date isn't set yet but i'm excited about it it's a historical fiction about a serial killer in paris during world war ii so Hits a lot of interesting boxes that I feel people will kind of have fun. I say fun, right? What is a serial killer that's fun? Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> um, but also travel wise, there's a lot of places my family and I are eager to visit next year. So we'll see which ones we land on. We're definitely going to France to revisit one of my wife and my favorite places together because it's our 10 year anniversary. So we thought that's going to be a, a nice place. But we always also try to do kind of a place because I've been to so many places. We try to do a place that's new for her, but then also a place that's new for me uh, because it's not always aligned and probably not next year, but Sri Lanka and Ethiopia are two on the top of my list of places that I have not yet been. And 
I am so excited to go once I get there. And I just have to kind of put it on the plan and be like, all right. Uh, other than that, I'm I'm still working on two more books that are fiction and perhaps a travel book. So uh, especially after talking to Jeremiah and Pat now, I, th I feel like I have to move forward with that. I was inspired by both of your ability to actually find what is so interesting about your travel experiences? Because I always think my travel experiences are boring, even though I'm supposed to be writing about these things. And I'm like, nobody wants to hear that. I what? Uh, but then I listen to you tell your stories, and I think, okay, maybe maybe more people want to hear it than I thought. So I'm excited to maybe give myself a little more, uh, put myself a little more at the center of these stories. Wow, you have many plans, Doc. Yeah, well, again, after hearing Pat, I feel like I had to up it a little. <laughs> the pressure. Yeah. And Jeremiah? Well, okay. I mentioned I was I had three three ideas, but actually just sitting here I realized I had four. Uh so next year marks the 20th anniversary since the first poetry collection came out. And so I was contemplating putting together a collected poems. Uh I don't know that anybody wants it, but yeah. You know, so <laughs> three of the four books are now out of print. I thought maybe just sort of celebrate that. And I'm I'm you know, pretty much done writing poetry. So that would kind of put a cap on that. Um, I've been, I originally had started working on a follow-up to the first book, which was the travel tales, because I made a big long list and I only wrote some of them. And so I've been slowly, you know, now and again, I write a few more of those. Um, so I mentioned the second book was based on my old travel website, which was based on my journals. And that was the first five years uh, Tibet to Egypt. Uh, so I was started working on the next five years. Um, but with the idea of, you know, now that I can include the photography, uh, this last trip, so this summer, I was working on this new idea of sort of, sort of like an around the world uh, in 80 days, but around the world in 80 photos. Hmm. And starting in Los Angeles and working my way around uh, and then basically, so each photo, you have a photo on a page, and on the next page, a little background information on the location, and then how I took the photo or what I was thinking when I did the photo. So that's probably going to be the next book. I'm, I'm slowly, I think I've done 20 of the 80 so far. Uh, I'm saving off because uh, I want to include some new, uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and the West Africa trip. I want to include those photos, which of course I have not taken yet because I've not done those trips yet. Um, so that's sort of the, that will probably be the next book. And then at some point, maybe the a follow up to the travel tales, because uh, I really enjoyed writing those. I, you know, each, each book I've done so far has been very different. So the travel tales were all just short and to just be, shared experience versus, you know, the latest book was come with me for this whole trip. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I, I still sort of just every now and again, get an idea or I see my old list and okay, I'll, I'll jot that down. And you know, I think maybe I have 10 written now. So I clearly need a lot more before I can do anything. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun having many ideas because, you know, if one's not flowing, then I'll just, oh, that's right. I started working on this one, <laughs> you know, yeah. work a little bit on that one again, or, oh, that one's not flowing. Oh, let me go back. Um, but yeah, the, the 80 photos idea, I think will probably be the next book. I think it's so interesting to read a book and see the photos. I love seeing photos. I think it gets more, I don't know, for a book, a, a travel book, I think it's, yeah, super interesting. Well, it's I, yeah, I've enjoyed it because I remember, you know, Paul Theroux is a famous travel writer, and I think it was in his first book, he, he made note that he intentionally doesn't travel with a camera, hmm. because that way he's forced to describe and, you know, be a witness. Uh, whereas, you know, I came about the other way. I started photographing first and then writing about hmm. it, and I actually like having it. I, it kind of takes a little pressure off of me. Uh, you know, I don't have to go to grueling detail about the descriptions of the site. I can show you a picture of it. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, it's been a nice balance. So yeah, like I said all the books going forward would be that way. So just it's just figuring out how to do it. Thank you, Jeremiah. So I think we are ending. We are ending this panel. And Marco, would you like to say something? 
Yeah, I, I want to say uh, I really enjoyed. This was my first panel and my first time as host. And of course, the subject is very interesting. You guys are very interesting. So thank you very much for all the stories. And uh, I, I really appreciate that you guys are uh, also um, normally sending out articles. Uh, and your articles are very interesting. We love the pictures. So keep keep coming. Yeah, <laughs> Keep sending them because we really need them and uh, we are enjoying <laughs> our, our audience also. And also, I would like to... Thank you for your time. To you are incredible guests. I was very happy that you accepted the invite to come to the RV Book Fair. And Pat, thank you very much. Thank you for your yeah. It's, it's been a joy, Lucia. I have so enjoyed meeting everyone. Thank you, and nice to be on the other side of the microphone for mm -hmm. once. Although I don't think it stops me talking so much, but, but <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you. I always say that that is the life of the party. And <laughs> Douglas, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, As long as you'll keep having me and you keep wanting my stories, I will, I will continue to be here. So always, I appreciate it. Always. Especially. And Seremaya, also thank you for staying in touch, for collaborating with the magazine and for being here today. Oh, absolutely. I thank you for the invite. Of course. I would like also to thank worldauthors.org for this space. And thank you for joining us. All the information will be on our website, www.relatable-media.com. And we see each other next time. Thank you.